Everybody comes from a widely varied background, lots of different interests, lots of different unique people. Uh, but the one thing that reigns true across the board is the fact that everybody in Charleston Beer is doing something because they really like to do it because it's too hard to, to keep doing this for any other reason. Living in Charleston has inspired the brewery in a couple ways. They kind of have a nautical theme with our art, the laid back lifestyle, very culinary uh, view on life really influences our beer. If we're gonna use a, another ingredient that's not a normal beer ingredient, we'll try and use something local. We do a oyster stout with uh, oysters from Bowens Island. We've aged our porter on South Carolina bacon. We use South Carolina pecans in Pecan Dreams, a brown ale that we put roasted pecans in every uh, fall. People in Charleston love Charleston, and the brewers are definitely included in that. I mean, Palmetto Brewing, the first one, you know, they're called Palmetto. I mean, this is the Palmetto State. So there's a lot of um, influence and a lot of, uh, a lot of love, really, from the brewers, uh, by the brewers for, for the city. With the amount of sunshine we get, the uh, temperatures we get, and the warm, summery weather that Charleston has, most of the local breweries here uh, in their regular lineup of beers will produce something in the way of a Pilsner or a Kolsch or a Belgian wheat beer, a Belgian blonde, uh, something that's light and refreshing, and that tends to suit the climate. We also stock a lot of craft canned beer. Uh, that works out with the water culture here, beach culture, uh, fishing culture, things like that. Uh, we seek a lot of inspiration from local Charleston ingredients, things that are cultivated or available to us in this area. Um, you know, whether it's sourcing local honeys, um, local botanicals, uh, even local tea. You know, one of our most popular beers that we've produced here on site at Edmonds Oast is an English mild ale brewed with Charleston Tea Plantation black tea. That's just one small example of ways that we use unusual and local ingredients in the beers that we produce here. Charleston in general is a different town than uh, any other town in the country. People call it like a city town where everybody kind of knows everybody anyways. So to have a beer community in a city like that, it's, it's kind of fun because it feels like your neighbor is brewing your beer for you. I feel like the smallness of Charleston really brings everything together. It's just everything is so tight-knit here. Everybody knows each other, everybody's friendly with each other. It just makes it really great. Most of the entrants are quite new and that means that you're getting all sorts of crazy new fresh ideas. People are not hemmed in by something they think they have to do because everyone else is doing it. I mean, you've got a new breweries now using wild yeasts that have been harvested in South Carolina. So Charleston itself is a huge source of inspiration. You know, it's, it's different because people are just doing their own thing. They're experimenting. Truly, this city is just getting started when it comes to craft beer. When you visit other towns and you check out the, 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 the huge array of beer styles and, and breweries, you know, the levels of business that some of these other breweries are operating at, what we see in Charleston is the fact that we are really all just getting off the ground. Just a few years ago, there were only two breweries in Charleston, and now we have a whopping eight, which is amazing. You're building friendships, you're building flavors, you're building basically a profile for Charleston. The beach life kind of rubs off on people, you know, it's a little bit more laid back. It's like you always got fresh air, and I think that kind of maybe relaxes people, maybe opens their minds a little bit more. Food has always been a focus of Charleston, and now with micro distilleries and microbreweries, or even nanobreweries popping up, it's a great complement to the existing food culture. Charleston being a, a very food-oriented community um, has absolutely embraced the beer at that level of good, fine food. Being a part of the craft beer community for me is seeing restaurants cater better to their customers, uh, seeing beer drinkers demand better beer, better service, local beers. Being a part of the Charleston craft community uh, has been huge for us. We, we feel like we've uh, done really well with the local community. And, for us, that's always been kind of a, a goal from the beginning was to support the local community. 
The benefits of drinking locally are really uh, staggering. I mean, if you think about keeping money in your local community, spending a dollar here and keeping a dollar here, uh, it means the world to so many small businesses, which drives job growth, uh, job creation, allows people to open new businesses and keep our economy stable and growing. You know, there's always that sense of community. The beers that you get to drink that are made, you know, five, ten miles, fifteen miles away. I mean, that says a lot, especially with the quality that's coming out of Charleston. Always good to support local. I think we are in a very lucky position where most everything that comes out local is pretty damn good. Back in the day, people used to go down to their local butcher and get their own meat from their butcher, and they used to go to their local brewer to get their beer, and it's just funny because we don't have that anymore, but I feel like it is getting better. Beer is a food product, right? And I don't know if anybody out there likes drinking older milk, but we think you should treat beer the same way. It should be cold, should be fresh, uh, and under most circumstances, most beer tastes better when it's fresher. Knowing that your local breweries are all struggling to make enough beer implies that we're selling it fast enough that we can't keep up. And if you pick up a six pack of our beer, it's going to be some of the freshest beer around. If you're buying local, eating local, supporting local farmers, you're getting it right from the source. Um, you know the farmer or the brewer and you're supporting them and the community and it just grows. The closest feed mill from us is about 80 miles away. And if we had to go once a week to pick up feed from the feed mills, we'd spend a lot of time going on the road picking up feed. All of this grain goes to a local farmer named Thomas Legree, and he feeds his cows with it. And that's what we do with the spent grain here at the Free House. It's kind of a nice working relationship where we get to dispose of something that if we had to dispose of on our own would be a pain and he gets free feed and it works out for both of us really well. Bavis Brewer away from me is 22 miles so we can get a lot of the grains right here in Charleston and use them to feed our cows. It cuts down considerably on the amount of other products we have to feed them and other grains and byproducts and it cuts down the amount of feed that we have to buy to feed our cows. Spent brewing grain still has about 60% of its nutritional content, and rather than waste that, we felt that it would be better used feeding cattle. You go back to 20 years ago, and the only beers you can find in Charleston are yellow and fizzy and come from Canada, the U.S., Mexico, or you paid extra to bring them over from Europe. And nothing was over 5 or 6% alcohol, and uh, there, there wasn't a whole lot happening. So in 2000, Dave was working at Palmetto, uh, the only brewery here in Charleston. At the time, there was a 5% by weight, 6.2 by volume, cap on all beer. Perhaps the most groundbreaking piece of legislation was the Pop the Cap legislation, which lifted the, the cap on what you could brew in this state, what you could sell in this state. Without that, we are not where we are today. Of the 60-something beers we've made, 50 would have been illegal prior to Pop the Cap. Before the Pop the Cap, before the 6.2 alcohol lift, if you wanted it, you homebrewed it. Homebrewing has been great for the Charleston community. Uh, we were members of Low Country Libations for a couple years. It was a great way for us to learn. We were able to bring our beer and um, help shape a lot of our recipes that way we got a lot of great feedback from members. Most if not all homebrewers are very ardent um, fans of craft beer. Homebrewers also make uh, fantastic consumers um, for the brewers because as homebrewers we are well aware of styles for one um, and also uh, defects that might be in a beer. Homebrewing allows you to produce at your house. You can not only learn the fundamentals, but you can experiment with ideas that may or may not work out in a commercial type brewing situation. It's an awesome way for people to express themselves and that's kind of how we fell in love with beer. Most, if not all, of the well-known craft brewers that have gone pro and are well-known names got their start in home brewing. That's where they cut their teeth. So, not only do um, most of the brewers start off their careers as simple home brewers, but I think in the future more and more of our home brewers will hopefully make it big time. 
Most home brewers I know understand that producing mediocre beer is very difficult. And for brewers here who make excellent beer, I think that cultures up a lot of respect for them and their craft and how good they are at what they do. In 2013, we introduced the Pint Law. The Pint Law sought to change the nature of what goes on in the tasting room. You can have three pints, which is 48 ounces, and you can still purchase that 288 ounces, a case of beer, to go. The pint bill is huge. It's, a, it's what allows you know, smaller guys, even smaller than me, the ability to, to actually maybe, hopefully, make some money, pay their bills, and keep their brewery open. We certainly have a wish list as to where we'd like to see the laws in South Carolina go. We still lag in some areas. Uh, one of the big ones is excise taxes. South Carolina is probably the, I believe it's the seventh or eighth uh, worst in the country. It's, it's 77 cents a gallon when you brew or sell beer, which is not very good for our brewers. So we would like to, to take a whack at that and, and cut that significantly, at least 50% cut. We recently introduced a bill um, that would allow brew pups to make more than the 2,000 barrels a year that they're limited to right now. It also give them the right to uh, go through a distributor and get their beers out in the market. Currently, if you go to a brew pub in South Carolina, you can't do that. You have to have it within the four walls of the facility. You can't go to a beer festival and have them. You have to go straight to the source. Um, the brew pub laws have not changed in 18 years in South Carolina, and so it's time that we really started to evolve that. I expect the, the beer scene to sort of explode because there's really no reason for it to be held back anymore. So I expect jobs, I expect economic impact. Right now we sit at an economic impact of $254 million a year. That's as of 2012, that's before the pint law. So just think of what, what that economic impact is, is gonna be and gonna mean. We'll get those numbers soon. I expect it's gonna be much, much higher. I think it will be a lot more fun, a lot more breweries, a lot more sense of community, just everything that I, I like in the world better and more. Without craft beer in Charleston, I would be a very sad person. I think um, not only me, but I think other people would find the community kind of lacking. It's like not having any restaurants. I feel like we're, we're all getting a chance to be in a moment in time where we're building something. And it's, it's more than just about profits, and it's about you know making something tangible. And at the end of the day, when you shrink wrap a pallet of cases of beer by hand, you get to look at that and say, I made that today. Um, it's inherently more exciting than a spreadsheet. Uh, and in the end, other people are going to take it and we get to you know, enhance other people's lives. We get to share a, a, a headspace with our fans when they're in the midst of some of the finest moments of their lives. And that's a pretty awesome place to be. We were the fifth brewery to open up, and that was a year ago. And since then, two more have opened. It could, in the next five years, we could see as many as 20 breweries. It's hard to say. Now that the new legislature for zoning has passed, it's going to open up a lot of the areas. I think you might see a lot more brew pubs. Look at cities like Asheville that have, you know, 20 breweries in the city, and we've got more people here, and I think we could definitely support more local breweries. You've got these awesome, awesome ambassadors like Scott and Rich and Brandon at Beer Exchange. I mean, just people that do it right, you know, that, that push it the right way. I hope that that mentality and that mindset can carry through with the new breweries, with the new stores opening, and flow through the community so we don't get that sense of jaded mentality that, you know, frankly, we've seen at other cities. And I think if we can stay on the positive, you know, this beer in my glass is damn good uh, mentality, then um, sky's the limit. Palmetto Brewery is a company that's been here for 20 years. We are still just figuring it out. Some of that's been empowered by the changes in laws, and some of that's really been fueled by a, ch a rapid change in public interest. Five years ago, the demand for local quality beer is not the same as it is now. And I expect that that trend is going to continue. And all of us that are working in this field right now are going to continue to see 
stress and pressure to keep making more because I don't think we've hit, we're anywhere near a, a critical mass in terms of number of breweries in the city and I don't believe that the demand for local beer has come anywhere near the, to its peak. In five years I hope that every glass of beer I get in Charleston comes through clean draft lines, uh, goes into a proper clean glass. I hope that the education, the work that everyone in the community has done as far as educating consumers has taken hold and we have a bigger community of people who are asking for local. I love the stuff that's being put out right now. It was funny because there was actually a couple that came in here a few months back. They were from Canada and they were taking a uh, trip around the states. And they came in here and they were sampling so many different beers. And at the end of the evening, they looked at me and said, is, is South Carolina known for really good beer? And I kind of laugh because I don't feel like we get the credibility that we should get. I feel like the stuff that's being made in this state and in this town um, it's some of the best that you can find in this country. Everyone that's a part of the Charleston craft beer community does it out of love. I mean, everyone. If you're trying to get rich or be, you know, popular, you do something else with your life. You stay in school and get a high paying office job and uh, hang out with the cool kids. There were definitely, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Ed with Palmetto opening up in the early 90s and the work that Jamie and Dave did to get South Carolina where it is now, I mean, we wouldn't be here without them. Beer people are happy people and we're just trying to make more of that happen. To think how far we've come since 2007 is, is remarkable, especially in a state where change is sometimes hard and it's hard for people to accept, but craft beer has certainly been an um, amazing exception to that general rule and I think we're going to see a lot more of that as people become more educated, more cultured, and learn about what it is and what it can be. Yeah. Should I do that for the interview? Just <laughs> that you know your average. I don't want to say average. That your. Yeah. Oh my God, this is hard. <laughs> it's kind of. This is gonna sound so dirty. A social lubricant. As long as I can get that like sparkle, like the 1950s, like housewife. You know, like when the dish soap sparkles in the, in the glass.